you must have been building up with the corporate work and all that previous reportage, photojournalism, big commissions, some really explosive images, and you keep bringing up the word stock. Mm. Corporate, I think, mm. gives that big opportunity to be doing far more in the moment, very, very valuable pictures. And you kind of exploited that then, didn't you? With a move into having your own picture agency in Wales. Now, with other stock agencies around, what could Steve Benwell do that, that would make this work? I mean, was it peculiar to Wales? Was, it, was anyone else trying? We're talking trans? about the photo library. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, but as I say, because I'd, I'd always kept copyright, I was aware of such things as photo libraries. I was aware they, aware they made money. I was aware that you could, photographers could make money from them and that could help you do what you want to do. Now, there were such... There are such animals as stock photographers. Now, they are different. They are a very special animal that goes and shoots stock. Nothing else. They go out every day. They have an idea what they want to do, and they shoot stock. Nothing else. And very, very specialised. They know what sells. They know what they have to have, and they make their living for stock photography. Now, I never wanted to be a stock photographer because oh, I just couldn't. I, I couldn't. I had to have a reason for going somewhere and shooting pictures. Either I was interested in the subject matter or, you know, somebody was sending me and I get a nice magazine spread or something. But I, the idea of just going out and photographing telephone boxes, and uh, I couldn't do it. But I was aware that, that it could be done. And in the early days of stock photography, you can make a very, very good living. There were some of the photographers that really did very, very well. But I didn't want to do that. But I wanted to make money from stock. A, because I could, and it, you know, there were not many things you can do if you're a photographer, apart from the world of photography, really, unless you, you know. So I was always aware of that. Um, but I never had enough images of my own to form a library, you know. So, OK, so I decided I wasn't going to be a stock photographer, which I did tie with. You know, I thought the idea of getting a minivan and, uh, you know, uh, sorry, a camper van and driving around the country and Europe and just doing stock. But I, I, no, I couldn't do it. Under what, covering any particular genre or style or topic? Was there anything? That anything, just because anything, anything right. and everything will sell. You know, a picture of a cloud, a picture of a, a, a field, a, you know, a dried up reservoir. Uh, but also I became aware that if you wanted to sell more in the corporate and advertising world, you needed things called model releases. Now, this is interesting because Sometimes you can sell a picture that you'd shot editorially or you'd shot while walking on the beach or something, but it could be bought for an advertising use. Now, so I started learning about, hang on, how can this happen? Uh, and agencies like, libraries like Tony Stone were very good at this. Um, and they made, you know, their photographers made a lot of money. I, I was never with Tony Stone. I was with the Telegraph Colour Library that was sort of similar, but not as, not as advertising as selective as Tony Stone was. But I did put pictures with the Telegraph Colour Lily from an early stage and was starting, you know, to make some decent sales. But also, I noticed that stock photographers were using models and doing shoots that they could have model release for so they could be used. Now, what, the way I did this, I use friends and family, you know, and I we sold an awful lot of my to kids, you know, when they were babies growing up, da da da. Because I got total model release. You know, I mm. photographed my mother at home, I photographed my gran in hospital, you know, <laughs> bless her. Because I could do it and I knew I got the model release and, and I could get perhaps better pictures than others because of my family. So I was more intimate pictures. So I, I started, you know, doing a lot more of that and being aware that they could be used as stock. And in fact one one picture which um I shot at the beach on Port Talbot. I think oh, I was doing a story on Port Talbot, sort of run down the steelworks and unemployment and all that. And I happened to photograph a woman, in an elderly woman in a dress, kicking a football in front of her. And she's kicked it up. And I put that with, maybe it was a telegraph, I think. And it was a nice picture, it was black and white. It was a nice sort of, you know, uh, human picture. It got picked up by an insurance company and they used it for their major ad campaign. It's the only time I've ever had a big use like that. And I probably got 
15 grand for that picture, mm. for that single picture, because it was used for them. But then I got a call <laughs> from the daughter of this woman. This woman happened to be, because I didn't speak to this woman. I did it on a long lens. But I thought, well, you know, it's not, I'm not making it look silly. It's a lovely picture. You know, I thought she'll love it. You know, so I didn't feel, I didn't feel anything bad about doing that picture. Um, some pictures I've taken in, and stories, you know, that I've thought, oh, no, I'm not putting this in because if this is used, you don't know what the caption is going to be. Mm -hmm. It could make these people look really bad. I'm not going to do it. So I was very, very careful what pictures, in fact, I, one picture I'll show you later, something I shot to Penn Reese. And the context, if I show you the picture, you will say, oh, look at this. This is about child abuse. This is about, and it was not, it was not, but the picture, you could interpret as that. Now, if I put that out and that was picked up by some, I mean, yeah, I can live with myself, you know. So I was very careful not to do that. But this picture didn't fall into that category. And I made a lot of money. Um, but I had a call from a daughter saying, you know, this is my mother. She didn't give you permission. Da, da, da. I said, well, yes, I know. I'm aware of that. But it's a nice picture. You know, it's not making her look silly or bad or anything. Would she like a print? Oh, 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 well, uh, OK. <laughs> Everything changed. Oh, I'm sure she'd love a print. So I, I got her address, sent her prints in Germany, had a nice letter back, you know. So those things happen, but you've got to be aware. And I knew for some photographers, wouldn't even do that. They would take a model with them. Like it could, it could be a family. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a you know, fashion model or, or, you know, it could be a family. So they'd have. So I was, aware, short I was aware yeah. that was a part of stock photography as well. Mm. Anyway, so I thought the only way I can do a photo library is to get more photographers because I can't do it on my own. So I have to represent other photographers. So I thought, well, it makes sense to do it in Wales and it makes sense for it to be of, of Wales because I know some Welsh photographers, I'm living here, we can market it as Wales. So we have a marketing advantage, we're not competing and we will be known as a best, the best location for sourcing imagery of Wales. That was the idea I had in my head. So um, this is around about 1998 now, so we're in the late 90s. Yes. I'm trying to remember. The internet was what? Oh, we, had, oh, we hadn't, got, we hadn't it, got the internet. We yeah. hadn't really got... Um, well, well it's, this was pre-digital, mm. um, pre-websites, was it? Yes. CD-ROMs well, would have been around. Websites were just coming Multimedia. in. Multimedia. CD, CDs were, yeah. On the front of most magazines at one point, weren't they? Yes, CDs that's right, that's right yeah. yeah. Um, but it was... Everybody was still shooting trannies. This wasn't um, digital. So I thought, hmm, maybe this could work. Um, so what I did, we we were in a cottage in Penturk or something. So I managed to buy the cottage next door, knocked through, and that became the office. So I got all these filing cabinets and we had screens and da, da, da. I thought, well, okay, I've got to get photographers. So first of all, I started contacting photographers I knew. And I'd ring them up and say, look, you know, we're starting this um, new venture called the Photo Library of Wales. Um, could we have some of your pictures? And we'll try and sell them and you'll get some money. But I didn't want it to be like um, a big deal for the... I, to get photographers interest, I thought, well, I can't make it... i got to make it so we don't put... Something doesn't put them off, like anything legal or something. They think... I had a bit of credibility, I felt, because I was a photographer myself. So they knew I wasn't a businessman trying to make money. So I think, you know, that helped. But also I said, look, no contracts. You can have your pictures back at any time you want. Take them out if you're not agreeing with what we're doing. So there was no real restrictions on them. And, you know, to my amazement, really, they started to say yes. So I'd, I'd go around to their houses or wherever. I'd edit, go through their trannies. I'd edit out what I thought would be useful. Brought them back to the library, we captioned, we mounted, oh, no, no, if they weren't mounted, we catalogued and we started building a system where we could, we broke Wales down into areas and so then we'd add a picture for say, I don't know, North, you know, Mary Honesty or Stodonia or wherever. So we put the pictures there and these are trannies in filing cabinets, in hanging sleeves, etc. So, you know, we got 10 photographers, 20 photographers, 30 photographers, 40, and it gradually snowballed. I then started travelling around Wales, contacting photographers that I'd either heard of or I'd seen their bylines in newspapers, magazines that are, you know, ringing them up and say, oh, you know, have you heard of us? Can I come and see you? 
started to do that. And I spent, you know, a couple of months driving around Wales and bringing the pictures back. And, you know, Kate was uh, helping doing the library side of it because she'd had experience working mm. in libraries in London, Paris, New York. So she knew about that. So, um, you know, she helped. Well, she did all that, really. We had a lot of photographers. And um, in fact, we counted up the other day at our height. We had 350 photographers in Wales. No. Yeah, 350. We had. Is there such a thing? Was there ever well, such a thing? I mean, these were, all were, were, of course, these weren't all professionals. We had professionals. But most of them were very keen, gifted amateurs. Or they did photography as part of their professional life. But we had 350. There weren't many we didn't have, to be honest. And uh, Actually thinking about it, Steve, I think there's something like 70-odd camera clubs in Wales, of which each of them must have like 10, 20, 30, maybe more members. Yeah. They yeah. would be aspiring. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah maybe, maybe that's not yeah. surprising. Yeah. But, and, and what amazed us was how good some of them were. Mm -hmm. you know? And we had, we had a wide range, you know, we had, we did have some news... Uh, reportage people we had sport we had aerial we had architectural photographers we had wildlife we had underwater photographers so we were beginning to build up a real good cross-section of imagery of Wales in Wales and it got to the point where we were the largest archive archive of contemporary we didn't we didn't we had some historical mm. but not many but contemporary Wales contemporary Wales. We, we had the largest collection mm. Anywhere, anywhere. So who were the clients then? Where was the work coming from? Well, um, then I started contacting uh, magazines, newspapers, book publishers, uh, television, anybody that used imagery, you know, calendar companies, absolutely anybody that I could think of that might use imagery of Wales. Um, and when we started, we were selling pictures to the Welsh Tourist Board. You know, even they wanted, because we had better pictures than they had. And... We were very quick, you know, we were very efficient. We could get pictures of them. Initially... Oh, the irony. So suddenly they were licensing an image without having to own it. Yeah. Hmm. Initially, we were having to send out transparencies by post because everything was tranny-based, which was expensive, you know, to um, send them out. But we did it. Then gradually digital came in. So we started scanning then. So we had to have people. We had about, at the height, we had about four or five people in the library scanning nothing else scanning 35 mil and 120 images maybe it's maybe 35 we had some 120 which is quite time consuming and you know but we knew once we got them then we'd have um, a digital images then digital photography developed to such a stage where photographers were shooting digital so then we could say okay send us your pictures on disc rather than trannies so they would post discs into us or, or drop them off and, um, so it changed from... When you were sending the trannies out, were you insuring those? Was there an insurance involved in oh, terms of... Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> that was interesting. Because we would insure them from transit, from us to them. But you know what it's like in some of these, particularly on newspapers and magazines, on picture desks, you know, there's they've got pictures all over the bloody place. You know, who's are we, oh, they're under there. The pictures get lost. You know, pictures get damaged. They send it to the printer. The printer cuts it open, tranny open. Oh, oh sorry about that. I just mm. sliced through a quarter of your, your tranny. But we were part of, what was that group we were part of? Uh, we were part of some organisation that um, supported us. Oh, I forget the name of it now. Picture Library. So there's a Picture Library Association that we joined. Anyway, but part of it was, if they lost one tranny, £200 they would have to pay. Now, we did have a, a couple of instances where they lost a sizable amount of imagery. If they'd lost 50 pictures at £200, that's a bit of money, and they had to pay it. And they would pay it because we would then tell the other libraries and they'd get blacklisted. They wouldn't send them. And what we were doing, we were paying the photographer 50% of any sales they would get. So even if... They lost their trannies, they would get 50% of, you know, quite a few thousand pounds. Mm. And we were starting to send really quite sizable checks out to photographers. We had some photographers who sent us a lot of pictures. Every week they were sending in pictures. We had a few 
um, that was constantly sending us hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of pictures. Some were sending half a dozen twice a year, you know. So we had, we had, you know, we had that cross section of uh, Matt coming in as well. Was there any particular type of work that was selling well? Uh, yes, um, we had one photographer um, called, and this is actually his name called Billy Stock, which is kind of uh, strange. That that is his name, and he he was interesting because he was very good technically in terms of using filters and making his pictures incredibly punchy. They were very colourful. He'd always use very slow exposures, probably five, ten minute exposures on some landscapes. And he was using filters to really get very, very punchy, colourful, warm, exciting imagery. Uh, when you put that against another picture of Millennium State or whatever, it stood out because it, it just punched you, you know. Mm. He, he was probably our best seller. Um, he loved doing, putting full moons in night shots as well, but he was so good at it. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't tell. Um, in fact, I even contacted Coke and Filters and said, look, you know, this guy uses your filter. He's bloody brilliant. You should, <laughs> you should give him a lot of money. He, and then we had, a, you know, a few other photographers who really supplied us regularly with work. Um, because some photographers who, you know, the perhaps um, people who had more experience knew that if they kept copyright, you know, they had the, all these pictures come back like I did. And they could, so a few photographers who did that would put pictures with us and they could put a lot of pictures with us. And we were sending out, you know, really sizable amounts of uh, every month we'd send out. And then I did a newsletter as well. So we'd have a newsletter saying, you know, this is what we sold. This is who we sold it to. This is this. So the photographers had an idea what pictures sold, who they sold to, and some idea of the money they were getting. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to focus their shooting. This, this is what's working. To, to say mm -hmm. what's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it worked. It really worked well, didn't it? For the first five, six years. Because we were, we were the only people, you know. Um, were any other small agencies springing up? Is there any competition uh, starting? Not, not really. There was one small existing agency, I can't remember, but not really on our scale. And certainly nobody had the amount of, you know, we had a lot, most of the photographers, really. What about things um, like sport? Yeah, we had a sports photographer. Mm. We had a lovely guy who did nothing but sport. And he was shooting for... Oh, well, sport, or I forget what the organisation was called there, but they would commission him to photograph, maybe do um, portraits of a sports star, and we would get his pictures. What about local or national press within Wales and magazines? Were they? Um, no, um, no, we wouldn't sell to n not you know, Western Mail. No, they well, they got you know they mm. get their own. Mm. Or maybe we did a couple of times, but certainly national, everything national. We, but we'd sell to. You know the BBC, uh, the political if the political manifestos every year we had they'd stand by our picture. We had a one year the Labour Party manifesto had all our pictures. Mm. Every picture was our picture, mm. um, because we, then we started getting known as what type of pictures we had, um, and we were you know we were getting more and more photographers and um, and it really worked well. It worked very do you well. do you remember if there was any kind of discipline amongst? I guess this is more the professional photographers, but you must have been trying to say to these 350-odd photographers, was there any discipline in captioning? And we call it metadata. Uh, Did uh, you know what you were actually yeah, handling? That's interesting. <laughs> when yeah, and that's, where. Yeah, that, that's interesting, captioning. Um, some were better than others. Some were very, very good. They would give us very good captions. Some were not. And sometimes we'd have to kind of work out where the bloody places were ourselves. Mm. You know, Kate did. So we, we got quite good at knowing where places were in Wales just by looking at an image of Wales. We got very good at that. Some were better than that. Sometimes, we, you know, we had to spend a lot of time captioning. Uh, because also the captioning had to fit in with our system. So it's no good them saying West Wales. That we had to know where in West Wales. Often we had to ring them back and say, where, where is this? Um, you know, we had to know exactly what village, where it was. Yeah, that was um, something we had to do, and we did. So, how were you managing the the library? Was it was a database? Was it bespoke, or were we using some kind of off the shelf package oh, well, to actually? Well, when it, early days when we were trying to, everything was just um, 
you know, is all analog stuff. You know, we'd have to have go to the section on Snowdonia, get all the trannies out, find we've got, we've got a picture of the summit of Snowdonia, whatever, it's in that. When it became digital, then we realized we had to have a searchable website and we had to, everything had to be digitized. Then, it, it, every, you know, things changed then. We commissioned a, a digital, um, a searchable website. Then all our images were, were captured accordingly. Um, were those just on the site? Were they just thumbnails and previews? Yes, on actual, the site we had yeah. um, very low resolution, 72 DPI, low resolution images that had a watermark because in those days you couldn't really take watermarks off very well. So we had a watermark and then I think, did we have a map on the site? So, or, or you could you could search, say, Cardiff. You could search, say, Cardiff Bay, Cardiff. Mm -hmm. You could search on that mm -hmm. and that would bring you up pages and pages and pages of images of Cardiff Bay. So you go through, you, you note the reference number of that image and then the client would say, okay, we want this reference number, um, can you and we and then we would email a high resolution, a three hundred DPI mm. image of that. Um, that's how that's how we did it. Because back in even those days, I mean, storage was expensive. We had <laughs> uh, our, our, our office looked like sort of Blackpool illumination. We had so many flashing lights, and because we had everything was uh, red. We probably had twenty four hard drives daisy chained. Mm. Or, or with different lights on. You go there at night and it was wonderful because you had all these <laughs> lights. So we were storing on hard drives, but we had I had a backup across the road in a neighbour's house where he had all the backup hard drives in case mm, we had a fire or something. Mm. Yeah, I was very conscious of losing everything because if we'd lost that, we'd have lost a whole lot. Mm. Everything had mm. gone overnight. Very conscious of that. This was before cloud and all this stuff. So storage, yes, it was necessary, but you know, we bought the hard drives and we did it. Um, so why did you stop? As digital developed, everybody became a photographer. Everybody could take quite good pictures. They could learn a bit of Photoshop and do good stuff. So the market became oversaturated with imagery. As a result, the prices went down. So we were, I was finding, I was sending for time with less and less money. And I, I started feeling bad about that, you know. Because mm -hmm. when, we, when we started, I, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but to try and encourage the photographers, I would send them more money than they'd earned, you know, which I shouldn't really have done. But I thought, you know, this guy is good. I want him to keep sending to money. I've only sent him a check for 60 pounds. I want it to be more, I'll double it or whatever just to try and encourage him to send more pictures in. Not, obviously, I couldn't do it with every photographer. But in the end, I was sending out smaller and smaller checks, and I thought, you know, this this guy or this... You know, they weren't all guys. They were some good female photographers as well. You know, I feel bad about sending this guy £25, you know. I thought, I can't keep doing this. Also, Alamy started. Now, I don't know the people that know Alamy, but Alamy started in Oxford or somewhere... I go had a lot of finance behind him and um, you know started very well very very good very good website and they started to get photographers sending zillions and zillions of pictures now, of course Welsh photographers started sending pictures in so we were competing at Alamy now mm. Alamy was selling in bulk they had lots of pictures lots of photographers so their prices were you know good well not, at not, one point at one point they were they were they were good. So photographers were making good money for money. So why should they send to us and not Alamy? And because Alamy was much bigger, they could make more money than we could make for them. So it made sense. I couldn't blame them for sending to Alamy. So we were competing against a very, very big competitor. The other real problem, which is the problem that you know pissed me off more than anything, was organisations giving away images free. Mm. And a big problem was with the Welsh Tourist Board, which went on to become Visit Wales. So years ago, when I used to work for Welsh Tourist Board and other photographers used to work for them, you used to get an assignment, shoot the pictures, give them what they wanted, all the, all the best stuff you keep for yourself. Well, not all the best stuff, but you know, you made sure that they had good stuff, they had what they wanted. But they didn't really want the other stuff because they had no library to put it. What were they going to do with it? Just sit there. So they weren't didn't mind if you had the other stuff and you could market it. Obviously, you wouldn't compete with them, mm. but you could market it. Then they started saying, "Okay, photographers got to sign a contract. It's all got to go to Crown Copyright. You'll get, 
you know, we'll take the pictures. Here's your day rate. Don't bother us again. We could use it for a major advertising campaign on the side of buses, 72 page posters. You will get nothing. You will not even get a credit. Now, I can, you know, I, that didn't sit well with me. But also, they were then giving the pictures away to anybody. So if an organisation or a newspaper or a magazine rang up, say, right, we're doing a feature on, I don't know, Pembrokeshire or something. You know, we want 20 pictures to run. They'd come to us, so we'd sort the pictures, we'd give them a price, because we would give them a price first, say, come to, I don't know, five grand for this. They say, fine. Then we get a call later, say, hang on, we've just realised from the tourist board, we can get similar pictures for nothing. So who are they going to go to? So it got so bad, I started contacting the MP and people say, look, you know, you are you are harming small Welsh businesses, photographers, and there's a lot of them who are suffering mm -hmm. because we can't sell their pictures because Tourist Board, which is funded by the taxpayer, funded by the photographers, you give them away free. This is not fair, is it? And the answer we always got back, well, well their remit is to promote Wales as cost effectively as they can. Now... You can't really argue with that. You know, it's legitimate, it's fair, but for, for an organisation like us, it made life very difficult for us. So our revenue was going down, down, down. And I think both of us saw that, you know, we're never going to win. We're never going to, you know, I would have battles weekly with the tourist board saying, no, don't do this, this is not fair. I also tried to get the photographers to band together. To say, look, because we knew who we were, you know, the photographers who worked for the tourists, but we knew each other. And I contacted them and I said, look, if we get together and say, you can't do this, you know, we want the copyright. They would have to do this. And some of them did, but they brought in outside photographers from London or somewhere to do it. And they didn't care. So I thought, we're not going to win this battle, you know. And so I think we both decided, let's move on. You mm -hmm. know, we, we'd done what we can. We'd been very successful for a period of years. You know, we'd help some photographers with some money that they wouldn't have got without us. But, you know, it's time to go. With photography, I, because I did various video projects with, well, still do, uh, with Welsh government, but WDA back in the back in the day. The contracts were quite, quite explicit. But on photography, if you were being paid a day rate to go to, Nevin up in the clean peninsula, you know, the famous golf mm. shots of the course and lovely because of the location. If that photographer was standing in that spot on that day with that fantastic weather yeah. and yeah. everything's perfect and goes, click, that's for the client. It takes one step to the left and goes, click, that's for me. Mm. Was there anything in the contracts with the client that would not allow you to use your own version of that photograph? Um, not as far as I'm aware, because I, I wasn't working as a photographer mm. when this came in, because mm. I, you know, I'd, I'd stopped. I wouldn't have done it anyway, but I never signed, I've never signed a contract ever. But I wasn't aware that it said, but I don't think it said that. You'd have to ask a photographer that's working mm. with that. I don't mm. know. All I know is that you, you know, it says assignment that we have the right, it goes to Crown Copyright, we can use it for anything. And you have no, no, you sign your name. That's as far as I assume it's said. I don't think it said that because photographers would have done it. Mm. And they didn't do it. So I'm assuming that it didn't say that, but I could be wrong. So you'd had enough. Yeah. It, it, well, it, you know, and it wasn't going to get back to the good old days, put it that way. Um, so we decided let's do something else. So how long did Photo Library Wheels last? Then? It, it started in 98. I did make a note, so was it 10 years or 12 years or... Because um, oh, I think 2010 was when you started video. Sorry, I started video was 2010, so mm. whatever okay. that is, 2000, yeah. Did, was video yes. creeping into the photo library scene then? Well, I was aware that, I think, uh, I knew that uh, Getty Library and Alamy had started doing video uh, clips, <clears throat> you know, five second generic clips of waves crashing on a beach, you know, mm. like that. Um, and I thought, could we incorporate this in Video Wales? And I sort of explored, but there weren't that many people doing it. And we were, again, we'd be competing with Alamy and Getty, and we couldn't do that, you know. And also, it, 
very time consuming to edit and to and to get a consistent format mm -hmm. photographers shooting on different different cameras um we didn't have the setup for that and i think i'd had enough of um of that work, type of work anyway I, I felt i needed to uh, to move on but i was uh, and of course now that video was coming with the cameras you know canon and nikon being able to shoot you know high quality 4k video it was becoming too possible without spending a lot of money to do some really fairly high quality stuff you know that that you could learn to edit a bit and do mm -hmm. so i was becoming very aware of that um but I wasn't really doing it myself at that stage, no. Mm. So what prompted you to move into video then? I, I can get the fact that it's still a camera, it's composing a frame, it's lighting, which you had all that experience in coming from the corporate side. I, I think, um, well, first of all, I thought I'll have a go at doing some little videos, some little, um, you know, shorts. Um, so I, I got a camera and one of the guys that one of the people that worked for us at um photo library is a guy called david barnes who's um <clears throat> he's now lecturing at the university of south wales and he i remember we were sitting in the office and this guy rang up and i didn't know him and he said i'm david barnes i'd like to come and work for you in the library I said, oh well thank you but you know we don't really need you we've got we've got people and we can't we haven't got that much money into the and then you ring again I say, well, no, I'm sorry. And then he'd ring again. And he got to a point where Kate and I said, we better give this guy a job because he keeps ringing us up. <laughs> anyway, so he came over and he's a lovely guy, you know, very enthusiastic. He had skill, he had knowledge of things that we didn't have, you know, in terms of photographic, He was because he was younger and he was more aware of, of uh, more trends in photography that I wasn't aware of. So he was very good for us because he, he taught us quite a lot, really. And we got on very well. We had similar interests in music and uh, various other things. So this was what, at the latter stages of yeah, photo uh, library? Uh, yes, uh, it had gone digital. Yeah, it wasn't the early stages. Uh, it had gone digital. So he, you know, he worked for us for a few years. Um, anyway, when we stopped video, well, I was still in contact with him. And, and he had a couple of colleagues in Bristol that were <clears throat> involved in the film world. He had a very good editor at The Beeb. He knew a very good film cameraman. And so we started talking about the possibility of doing little documentary still films together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we'd go it together, we'd shoot it together and we'd edit it. And, and we did we did a couple. We did a first one was on a quite a famous banjo player who lived in our village. <clears throat> so we did a video on him and we edited it. We had music to it and, and it and it, you know, it's only a few minutes, but it was really interesting. I thought, wow. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. I'm doing a documentary video. It's like going back to stills, you know. I'm, I'm shooting a picture story, but it's moving and it's got music and audio. This is lovely. I like this. And that particular, at that time, the Guardian Online was showing stills that people had sent in, and they had a page of of documentary stills. And I sent this doc up, and they bought it. I thought, wow. You know, maybe we could, there's something in this, we could do this. So then we started to do, okay, let's think of other ideas. So we had another idea, we did a picture, of, uh, a picture, um, a video of a documentary of a retired serviceman who got injured in, in, uh, in service. And he was driving a motability scooter, first of all around Wales and then around the UK. So we contacted him, we followed him around on his motability scooter. And we did a lovely little... Um, a lovely little doc of him doing that and that you know that went down very well so then we started i started getting more involved in audio you know okay i'm gonna have to get sennheiser mics and all this stuff i'm gonna have to learn so i started learning about it. i went on a course on cameras um you know what cameras were available <clears throat> what you could do what you needed how much they cost so i started to learn about not not dslrs but bigger you know mm. bigger cameras mm. uh, more serious expensive cameras because I think I needed to know about that part of it you know I knew a bit about 35 mil cameras and then I started to go you know we joined the chapter of filmmakers association what it was they would screen f films every week or something and we'd go along and be critten so I started to learn about what other people were doing so you know so I really you know I really did start to to get a bit more interested and then um I started well I 
Now I bought a Black Magic camera. I don't know if you know Black Magic, but you know it's a really nice a camera that I could work with. Very good quality video, so, yes, and it felt like a you know a camera. So I started mm. doing some stuff on that, um, and then but I was still working with Dave in a way. And then we did a you know the Elvis Festival in Porthcawl mm. every year. Well, we thought that would make a good documentary, but that's going to be a big you know. 30, 40 minute documentary that we could offer to television. Um, okay, but we're going to have to up our game if we're going to do that. We can't do that with. So Dave contacted his the people he knew, the editor, the film cameraman. Um, I hired a quite a big camera. We had another. I had the same guy working. So we had two crews. We had two camera crews with you know tethered to the same guys. So we contacted the organizer of the. Um, Elvis Festival. He said, "You know, we really like to do this documentary on, on the not not looking at outside, but looking in. We want we want to follow you around. We want to follow all the problems you have, trying to organise this bloody, the, all the hassles you have with politics. Of you know, the, are you interested?" And he was a very interesting interesting guy, and he went for it. Yeah, so he gave us total access to him and the inside of the, and it's quite a you know an interesting set up to, mm. to make this thing work it's mm. quite a big event uh, for the town mm. itself so we we spent a i think it went on for we spent about a week on it all together um at fourth course so we did all this and then we had an enormous amount of footage that we had to edit and then to be honest i i was moving on to other things and dave was really into it and he took it over it became his baby and he arranged the editing and I, I didn't really get involved in all that, but I, you know, the concept and all that. And he did very well. He'd had a screening. Um, he'd had a, you know, a cinema screening, and he was entered in a, one of the national documentary festivals. And um, you know, it was, you know, really good piece of work. I think, um, you know, mainly down to Dave because he, he put an incredible amount of work into it. And you know, I think it was good for him as well into the, the things that he went on to do, and it, you know, he's obviously still doing. But so by that, this point, you've you've put you've invested in your own professional development, moving into kind of looking at video, yep. and sound. So commercial must appear. Oh, that, that that was the other thing. We weren't making any money, mm. you know. So I thought, okay, this is doing really interesting, doing work I want to do, but I'm not making any money. Um, so I thought, okay, the only way to make money, it goes back to photography, is, is to do corporate. You know, it's to get involved because it's the only place where there is money. Um, so, you know, I started finding out about the corporate use of photography um, and how you do corporate films and what particular clients would be approachable for that. But again, again, you know, I said, OK, you can't do this on your own. I had to have, you know, a film is not about normally it's about involving other people. Mm. So I contacted a, a photographer friend called Simon Regan, who I knew, a studio photographer, and said, look, if we do this, would you come in to do the technical camera side? Because Simon, you know, as you know, he's, he's just a genius. <laughs> he can do anything. Uh, that We've got to have him because he can do what I can't do. And he was good, yeah. You know, he wanted to come on board. Um, David Williams, another photographer friend, um, he had quite a bit of equipment. Um, so I thought if we pull our equipment, you know, we've got good cameras, we've got lights, we've got stands, we've got uh, Sennheiser mics, you know. I knew a, a sound guy who works with the Beeb. He was interested in coming in and working with us. Um, so we, we started to get a little team together, mm. you know. Mm. I thought, well, okay, we need a writer because, you know, we're going to have to script these things. We can't just go in. Um, I met a a playwright um, called Neil Beber. And he, you know, really, he writes really serious playwright stuff for the, uh, the arts council and things and, and, and to you know, um, theatre companies. Mm. So, he, you know, he's very serious on that level. He was, he was quite up, but also he was very good at writing corporate, um, you know, corporate screenwriter. He could, he could put his hand to anything. Mm. Um, so, you know, I said to him, would you be interested in, in coming into, you know, being, being a screenwriter, for, uh, scriptwriter for us for that? And he was interested. So, so then we had a new, like four, five, six people. So I thought, OK, we can, we can do it now. You know, we can start. And I knew there were existing uh, video companies, you know, much more established than we were. Um, 
So were you basically pulling freelancers? When yes, you yeah, them? all freelancers. Yeah, yeah they, they weren't they weren't involved in the finances of the mm. company. So mm. I the idea that I would I would I would pitch for the work. I would write the proposals. <clears throat> I would get the work. Then I'd work out what we needed. You know, what cameras we needed. How many days mm. did we need models? Do we need da 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 da? We shoot it, and then you know we get the edit. Uh, we do that. Um, I got better at editing. I quite liked editing. I found that quite. Um, I found it quite interesting. So working with images and, uh, but I knew anything once he got involved animation or anything really quite technical. I would have to bring in somebody who actually knew what they were doing because I, you know, so I could do the basic stuff. I would do initial edit, and then I say, okay, you come in, sit with me. How do we make this better? Can we animate that bit? Can da 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 da. Uh, so Neil would do the words and that started to work very well you know we started getting clients we did ING Bank we did a video for intellectual property obviously Newport we did Development Trust we did a big video with animation for Zodiac Aero um, so it was all going quite and it was we're making money because you know when you get these jobs there's, there's money in, in corporate so that worked that worked very well then we had the opportunity to pitch for it was like a, it was a drama but it was around a um an eco, a, a subject that, that had sort of documentary it was about um how we were using the earth's resources and we were not replenishing them and how if we had to change so it, it had a sort of social theme but it was they wanted it you know, they wanted actors mm. and, they, and they wanted a drama situation. Anyway, uh, a guy at the university, a professor, Professor Kelvin Jones, he he was a driving force from the... Uni it, sorry, this was um, commissioned by the Cardiff University. He was a driving force behind it, and he'd managed to get quite a bit of money for various departments to produce this film. And he wanted to work on the script because he had lots of facts that he wanted to say this is what's happening to the world you know solar power is producing this if we don't you know, all these kinds of facts and figures he wanted woven into the fabric of the dialogue to make it not only interesting and quite fun but you know to actually say something so um we went to the interview we pitched for the job and to my amazement, we got the job. I thought, oh, wow, okay, this is but this is big. You know, this is something I've never done before. We talk actors. We're talking about proper screen. Proper, yeah, this is yeah. proper television. I, I, can't, I can't do this. So I, I so you know, so after the panic had died down a bit, I thought, okay, well, let's have a go. <laughs> what can possibly go wrong? Um, so I thought, okay, we can do it, but I can't do it like. A proper company would do it. I, you know, we can't do these re reverse angle dialogue shots because I don't know how to do it. I've got no idea how they do it. We haven't got the gear to do it. We haven't got the crews to do it. And they wanted to start shooting in about 10 days. Um, we, we'd um, we got the actors. We had to, um, you know, find... We had to about six act actors. So, um, so we got them set up. We got the script pretty much set up. So I thought... How am I going to do this? And, you know, I'd always been interested in film, uh, well, aspects of film, you know, particularly black and white. But I particularly liked a, there's a Swedish director called Rai Anderson. I don't know if you know of his work. But he does a lot of commercials for Swedish television, but he's also done some features. He did, I think, or songs from the second floor. And his biggest one was a pigeon sat on a branch reflecting on existence. And these are really weird things, you know, being Sweden, Swedish, they would be. They're very surreal and very stylized. But what he does, he sets the camera up in a fixed position on a wide angle and that's it. So all the action happens in front of the camera. So we use, he very cleverly uses windows, he uses open doors, he uses hallways. So you can see a scene, and the scenes are very long. So they're very long takes, you know, probably five, ten minutes of one. Single camera. A, yeah, single camera, single camera, wide angle. And, you know, I'd never, I don't know anybody else that does it this way, but he's, you know, he's famous for it. Um, 
and they are, but he, but also his use of humour, the situation very funny, very, very dark humour, mm. and you know, sort of Scandinavian type, you know. And I thought, well, if I adopt this situation, I can do it this way. As long as I work out how the scene works and the action works, and it'll be easy. We can light it. We can have a camera. So we did it that way. Mm. And it, you know, Kate was one of the actresses because you know she um, obviously could help the other actors with with their, everything. So you know, Kate was one of the um, people in, in in the in the film, and we did it and we produced it and it went down very well. We had a, a red carpet screening at. Um, in Cardiff at Cine World, mm. um, but you know I learnt an awful lot in that because it was so different from what I'd started. But I and then I realised, okay, this is fun, but you know I don't want to do this more because I'm not, you know, I'm not coming out as a from a young person. There's so much that I don't know. The people we were competing with were way above us in terms. In fact, I felt almost a bit of a fraud what we were doing because I shouldn't really be, you know, we shouldn't really be doing what we're doing because we don't know enough. We Could you tailor it. the work or the, the, the projects that you would pitch for to suit what you wanted to do? We could, but there wasn't enough mm. work available. You know, you had to pitch for whatever jobs were out there. Right, yeah. Oh, if we had had that luxury, yes, we could have done some really nice... Because I had some really I nice ideas how I could use photography differently to what the normal way of shooting a mm -hmm. and I, and I st because I started going to um, the thing at chapter I started to see films at independent film you know and then Vimeo started you know Vimeo and I started looking at the shorts on Vimeo and I got really into Vimeo watching and I thought so this is incredible a lot of them were shot by ex-photographers mm -hmm. ex-stills photographers mm -hmm. because they knew how to frame they knew about light now, they weren't coming from film school, but they're coming from a photographic back. I thought, mm. wow. And you know that the cameras now, you could have 4K quality mm. on. You could use prime lenses, mm. things like that, that were affordable. And I thought, you know, this is doable, but um, not necessarily going to make... Mm. Beca because the market for it... Mm. You know, I who's think it's, pay that, a lot of money? Uh, it's just that steady and relentless march of technology, isn't it? The way it has impacted both the stills photography and video. Now, everyone thinks they're a photographer. Everyone thinks That's right, that they yeah. are a filmmaker if they want to be. But yeah, yeah, again, yeah. It's, there's those tiers of talent. Yeah. And then yeah. whether you're any good at it yeah. and sticking to one thing yeah. and doing it well. Um, but it sounds a bit trite, but. Is there any one takeaway do you think that you brought from that training in that start in photography into the video production? If, if there's anything, I think it, it's the the image in front of, of, of the lens. You know, I, I, I always like to. It's like coming back to photography. You know, you get your background first. The first thing you do is get your background, so you you, you get where you want, and then the action can happen in front of it, which is exactly the same as stills. You get where you want. You know. You get the position, so you, you hope that action will happen that makes it, and you press the button at a time when you think it's going to happen, or you do a series of pictures and then you edit backwards, okay? Which is very similar to the way you can work. And, and some photographers, uh, sorry, some filmmakers do it, you know, they, they adopt a similar approach. But the, if you look at their, you know, look at their history, a photographic background stills photo would figure somewhere in it they would know how photographers how a photographer's eye works um, which is perhaps different to a film cameraman in a way because they are aware they have different skills they're aware of different things you know I, I was so it was always a, a photographic thing that was my starting point and if I could make interesting things happen with that then that was a bonus so yes there was a big carryover but there were limitations because, um, you know, money and stuff. And so I, then I, I think we decided, well, OK, you know, we can do more of this, but we'll always be limited by funds, really. So I thought, well, there are other things I want to do, you know, that I've never had time to do because I've always been travelling or working. There are other things I want to spend, you know, a few years enjoying doing. Mm -hmm. So we made that decision. And that's what we did. <laughs> and you pulled out of 
Both, both stills and video. I stopped everything. Yeah. I, I, when was the last thing you picked up a camera then? <sighs> well, you know, I, I do take a few things, but not nothing. Anything interesting? No, think? not really, because I made a decision. I want to get out of it. I, I, I'd had enough, really, of you know, hustling for work. Being a freelancer for forty years takes its toll, I think, and you know, so much hustling. Not just hustling for work, but hustling to get paid for work. Mm. You know, and I thought, I've done it, I've worked really hard, you know, I've enjoyed it, I've learned an incredible amount, I've met some incredible people, been to some places that I would never ever have got into had I not been a camera uh, photographer and had a little thing called a press card. Never have got into. So, you know. So, is there nothing that will get Steve Benbow's photography mojo back? To st it's even to stills photography on your own terms. Uh, well, you know, I still, you know, I, I still love black and white photography. You know, I love mm. looking at black and white photographs. I love, I like talking to photographers. You know, friends I have and seeing their work and looking at books and everything. But I don't want to do it myself. I want to play the guitar. I want to go mountain biking. I want to do things that I've never been able to do. <laughs> but it doesn't mean to say, you know, I still black and white photography will always be. My first love. <laughs>